So, as most of you know, 5G is reality nowadays. And uh, like uh, worldwide operators start rolling 5G and uh, deploying it to, like, let's say, Korea, Japan, USA, uh, even in Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Kuwait, and many other. And uh, already the research part, like, uh, already moving toward 6G. So, uh, as, uh, let's say, like uh, a summary, first, I'll be introducing a bit about uh, the cellular domain in general and uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, like small differences. Like, then we'll do like a topic overview with that. Then we'll move toward uh, some fundamentals that it's needed on, uh, let's say, to understand uh, the cellular domain and how it works in general. Uh, then we'll spend some time with the current challenges that uh, 4G or like 5G engineers will be facing from now on, like for the incoming years. Then at the end, we'll be like uh, listing some vendors uh, and the operators where you can like work as a 4G optimizer. Then we will stop by the typical job rules for uh, the safe and such domain. And we will mention like which one are exactly related to 4G optimization. Then I'll introduce uh, like two case studies, but I'll like I'll make them simple. I'm not going to too much deep, uh, like too much deep uh, in detail in both of them. Then we will like uh, list the current research trend and how we can, uh, like how can an engineer get into such domain. So let's get started. So when we talk about the cellular domain, let's say we need to start from the beginning, but since I'm talking about cellular, I will not be mentioning anything about PSTN or landline. We will just like uh, concentrate about the cellular networks, which for the public, even not radar network or anything like that, which used by the army many years before that. So we first start with the 1G or uh, AMPS, and some uh, countries it was known as TACS. Uh, AMPS stands for Advanced Mobile Phone System. And uh, it was mainly like in the 1980, it was developed in uh, Bell Laboratories in US. And uh, for sure, for like, Bell Laboratories is still existing now, but now it's part of uh, Nokia. And uh, as per my knowledge, like when I do research or something about 1G, I guess it was not too much common and not too many countries in the world like rolled out 1G. And there are like different names, for example, in some countries in Europe for, for like Scandinavian countries, they have their own uh, like standard. Uh, France, uh, Germany, they have other, Japan has another one and like that. So it was not too much common. Then after like almost 11 to 12 years, the standard of uh, 2G or GSM emerged. Now, this was like, uh, if we think about like, it was too much common, like all the world worldwide built a GSM network. Uh, now it was a lot of improvement if we compare, let's say the GSM to the 1G. In the 1G, we mainly using uh, analog modulation, which was FM, but then in the GSM and uh, afterwards, we moved toward digital modulation. So this was like the first uh, big step, like in terms of uh, modulation, as well as let's say the, the frequency bands, like along the 2G come different standards like uh, GPRS or edge. Uh, GPRS, it was like uh, known as 2.5G. It was like general packet radio services. It was when we first introduced packet services like MS messages and such stuff. Then edge, which was enhanced at the like rate for GSM evolution. It was known as 2.75G. Now, the enhancement here comes where that in 1G, we're like working mainly on 800 megahertz frequency band. But for 2G, we start working with let's say, 900 megahertz, then with the introduction of GPRS, and which we like as well, we will be able to working uh, to we will be able to work on uh, 1.8. So the frequency band becomes higher. After that, uh, the 3G standard emerged, and uh, it starts since 2000. But uh, like it took some years for the 3G to start spreading worldwide. So, like if you go back into 2000, it was mainly only trials, and uh, then in 2001, 2000. To like the operator start rolling out 3G a bit worldwide. Uh, initially, let's say if we compare like 3G to 2G, it was somehow a different concept. Uh, 3G was work based like on uh, wideband CDMA or CDMA in some countries. 
uh, while PG, as we said, like it was this digital modulation, like uh, Gaussian minimum shift key, uh, which totally is something like uh, different. Now, the bandwidth that 2G was taking was 200 kilohertz, while the 3G, you need 5 megahertz for, like, for the band. And uh, since we're working in 2.1, we had like, uh, let's say, more bands, so we can occupy easily for one carrier, let's say, one band of 5 megahertz. Then, more than that, 3G emerged as well more, so we were able to uh, upgrade the bands from 5 megahertz to 20 megahertz by using four carriers. Then by using some technologies like dual cell, uh, we were like able to provide, for example, like two carriers like 10 meg or like 20 meg for one user in order to improve the data rates. So, uh, but these improvements came after, like not at the beginning, after they came after many years, after like the HSPA introduced, HSP, HSPA, as well as what's known as HSPA. And uh, mostly in all of your mobile phones, if you turn on data, uh, if you have like H or H plus up, that means like you are either like on HSPA network or HSPA. This is like many years before yeah, it was the reality. And if you have E, that means you are an H network, which is 2G. Now, after, let's say, 3G, uh, there was a big jump, like which was uh, the 4G. And we really needed the 4G network at that time because well, with the introduction of the smartphone, and say it was led by Apple, for example, uh, they introduced the iPhone. So from 2007, like, and afterward, let's say 2008, 2009, the smartphone becomes uh, too much common and it starts spreading uh, worldwide. So what happened actually, something needs to be done in order to overcome all of this traffic because with all the advancement that we had in 3G, we still have a lot of issues. So the ATSI were working for the last six years almost to introduce, like to, re, like on research to introduce a new standard, which was the 4G or LTE, long term evolution. And uh, mostly, I guess, worldwide nowadays, everyone has the 4G network. So whenever like you turn on your data, you have like LTE or 4G. In some cases, in deep indoor cases, you will have uh, 3G or like you will go to HSPA. And now, uh, 4G services became mature with the time, and it was really achieving higher data rate compared to 3G. Uh, let's say, even if we think about it nowadays, let's say at, inside our homes, we mostly no longer have landline phones. Like most of the people, like uh, they dump the landline phones, and everyone, like each one at home, he has his own like cellular phone. So it became like a very essential part, like an essential part in our daily life. Even nowadays, you find that the kids even like having uh, smartphones. And since now we are in uh, 2020, uh, and in like the researchers were working on the clock since 2010, 2011, uh, to introduce a new standard. And uh, the standard was finalized, uh, let's say uh, back in 2019, uh, like first it, like it was, uh, uh, it produced like two parts, but it was finalized in 2019, and there were like already some testing, which is done in Korea and US, Verizon and SK Telecom in Korea were leading actually on the 5G networks, until nowadays actually they are both leading. Uh, so what we can let's say uh, about uh, 5G that it was, uh, or it is, I will not say it, but it is an advancement for the 4G network. It's like more flexible, it supports higher traffic, and it will support, let's say, higher number of users. And uh, for now, let's say 5G is reality, and we just started rolling out 5G worldwide, but the researchers already start working in 6G, and the first uh, meeting for 6G took uh, place on Finland back in uh, 2018, December, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, since that time, like for the last year, 2019, already, the researcher decided uh, how the 6G will be and what are research points that they are targeting for the 6G. And uh, they put like a target on themselves, like it will be 2030. And some of them, they said as well, it will be the end of the smartphone era and we might see something new actually. It's something like different, not a smartphone era. It might be chip phones, it might be holographic phones. No one knows actually. 
the future will show us. So initially, I'll be like about talking about some fundamentals here. Uh, now, these fundamentals be like introducing what do you see like as uh, an upper level for like the real network, how it's really implemented. For example, here we have this one. I took it from a white paper from Rod and Schwartz. Uh, they have uh, like uh, they have uh, put like always the, like uh, good equipment in order like the testing for the five for four G, three G, two G, even five G networks nowadays. So as a general, we can say like here we have mobile device, UE unit, or IoT because this is like IoT since it's talking. We are talking about five uh, G network. Then we have something here called the RAN network. Now in the next slide, we'll just show the difference on the RAN networks for 2G, 3G, and 4G. Then you have here the core network. Now the core network, it will be connecting us to different, let's say, to the internet or different services, for example, IMS, uh, IMS, IMS or internet, like, like multimedia services in order for the VoIP calls. So, but when we talk about 4G optimization, we are working here on this radio interface. This from here, like let's say core networking, we are not like uh, talking about it. When we talk 4G optimization, we are talking about this link, the link between the UE devices or mobile devices, IoT devices with the base station. And now I'll just introduce a bit, let's say about the different RAN architecture. We have, let's say between, like, we have 2G, 3G, 4G. And then after that, we'll like talk about more about the challenges in such networks. So if we see here 2G, initially it was like this different UE, will connect like BTS and BSC, both of them will be like representing our RAN network for 2G. So the UE will be connecting to BTSs, then many BTSs will be connecting to one BSC. So here the job is mainly what is to optimize these links toward the UE to make sure like you will not have drop calls, you will not have, uh, let's say, any issues with the uh, let's say services, for example, uh, some data services, no problem with SMSs, stuff like that. And how we were like managing it, we were managing it through the BTC. Now, how it works in the next slide, we'll just show, show like uh, how it actually works, like the KPIs and some drive test logs, or some drive test log snaps. Uh, next, we we'll talk about 3G. If we can see like it was almost the same, but they changed the name from BTS to node B, it becomes somehow more advanced, the operations done here is like more advanced, different integration and better channel coding. And different, you know, like node Bs will be connecting to RNCs. RNC is like replacing the BSC here. Actually, to optimize these links here for 3G network, it was way harder than optimizing the 2G network. Since you'll have, let's say, both sessions, C sessions for voice calls and data sessions. and Let's say with the introduction of smartphones in 2007-2008, the traffic start becoming higher, so optimizing 3G network was quite difficult. And for sure, you need to make sure that both networks are optimized and working properly with each other. Because, for example, let's say that you are doing a voice call here on a 3G network, and you are out of coverage, so you will go down to 2G network. Even though on 3G, there is, as well, I can introduce lower bands, so initially it was only 2.1, then uh, there was there's something called U900, which was introduced mainly like for, if they wanna, let's say, dismantle 2G network in the future, the U900 can replace it actually for voice calls. Then if we move now to 4G, we will see it's completely different. Now we don't have, let's say, two parts on the RAN network, we have only here something called E node B, or enhanced node B, it's our advanced node B, it's like it's more advanced. So. Inside this E node B, you will, it will do the operation of both, the node B and the RNC together. Now, optimizing the 4G network, uh, I would say from my experience, it was um, somehow a bit easier than optimizing 3G network. Uh, why? Because here we have only data sessions, mainly. And initially, there was something called the CS fallback. So whenever you have a voice call or something like that, you directly, like, uh, go either to a 3G or 2G network. Like there will be something called mobility, so right away you just move, or the series selection that you move to either 3G or 2G network to do the voice call, and it was mainly for that. So optimizing the 4G network was a bit easier than optimizing 3G network. Uh, nowadays, for sure, like, or not nowadays, it's like since 2014, 2015, Volti, which is voice over LT networks, like uh, starts spreading worldwide, and that's why if we go back here, 
we need this IMS. IMS, it's mainly like to provide the volticles for the 4G network. Now, this is like uh, a simple code that I wrote a MATLAB just to show you like, how is it? For example, these, let's say black dots, it's like the base stations. And here I dropped some, uh, let's say UEs. And uh, these numbers, like we can, in 4G, it's called something called PCI, which is like physical cell identity that each cell need to have its own cell ID. And the same concept as well, like followed in 5G. In 4G, we have from 0 to 503. In 5G, we have from 0 to 1007. Uh, and this is like go back to how we actually originally origin like uh, generate uh, such uh, PCIs or such codes. Uh, so now let's like deal a bit uh, about how you what you can see in reality. You can see something like that to do analyze this 4G optimization KPIs. Uh, mainly, uh, what we need to do is OSS KPIs. These ones you will take it from the system. Usually we analyze it using Excel, so you just take the KPIs, then you analyze it, and you check, let's say, the drops, uh, cell availability, stuff like that. Now, each uh, vendor, you know, each company, they have their own OS system. So the way it works, it depends on which vendor you are working uh, with, actually. So it could be like different from Ericsson to Nokia to Altio Star to Huawei, to even to ZT. Uh, other things like we can do as well to confirm the performance, something called DT looks like we send, let's say, someone with a UE devices and they will be driving in the area. Or if, uh, let's say if they are wanna if wanna check some malls or something, they will be like walking inside, so either a drive test or a walk test. Then from there we collect these logs and we will try to see the coverage, what's actually happening here. Uh, is it okay or not? What we can do to improve it. So mainly when we say 4G optimization. Our idea is to improve coverage, capacity, and make the customer happy. And for sure, there are other things like hardware check, health check, stuff like that. Uh, let's say trace logs, transport checking, out of other things. And uh, for sure, if you enter this demand, you work on it, like you will be like interfacing with teams, uh, like different brands from different teams, where sometimes you need like three or four teams in order to troubleshoot uh, one case. And in case it's like we have transport with the core or transmission. So, so like a lot of steps can be done analyzing such 